The panelists uh, today really need no introduction, and so we'll <laughs> spare you a lengthy introduction for them. We're certainly joined by Bill Dean, who is the Regional Administrator from Region 1, Vic McCree, who is the Regional Administrator for Region 2, Cindy Peterson, who is the Regional Administrator for Region 3, Mark DePaul, who is the Regional Administrator for Region 4, Maria Korsnick, who is the Acting Chief Executive Officer and Chief Nuclear Officer for Constellation Energy Nuclear Group, and Danny Bost, who was the Executive Vice President and Chief Nuclear Officer of Southern Nuclear Company. Well, as we uh, begin the session, or before we begin the session, I want to provide uh, an opportunity uh, to start where really we started the session, the executive session this morning. As a number of people have noted, uh, and certainly as we discussed in that session, both the industry and uh, NRC senior managers had an opportunity to travel to Japan uh, on almost, uh, for us, almost uh, leading up to the third anniversary uh, that we marked on the 11th of March. We, as a group from the NRC, speaking for the NRC, traveled as a group of senior managers and found that visit uh, to be highly impactful. Um, and I know that the industry uh, chief nuclear officers also found that trip to be very valuable. And so before we begin the detailed questions, I'd like to provide an opportunity for the panelists to spend uh, a few minutes to talk about uh, a few of their perspectives face, based on that trip. And so I'll start with Vic and then ask Cindy to go next. We'll ask then Mark to go and then Bill, would you go? And then we'll go with the industry, Maria, and then Danny last. So let me just turn over the floor to Bill. Please begin. Vic. Thanks, Mike. Um, well, the first thing I'd like to do is, is thank uh, Mike Johnson uh, for his foresight uh, and vision and courage, actually, uh, to take all of his direct reports uh, out of the country uh, for uh, about seven days on an unprecedented visit. Uh, this was the first time that uh, all of the reactor uh, direct reports to Mike Johnson have, have taken a trip such as this. And again, I want to thank Mike uh, for that. Um, as you can imagine, or perhaps already know, either from the CNOs in this room who visited last fall or others who are aware of what happened uh, in Japan almost three years ago, uh, this was an awesome, awesome experience. Um, and at times, I was, I was humbled and, and overwhelmed by what we saw, uh, at, particularly at Kashiwazaki, uh, excuse me, at uh, Fukushima Daiichi and, and Fukushima uh, uh, Dainai. Um, and even three years later, the, the damage from uh, the seismic event and the tsunami was, was still evident. Uh, and it was very sobering, uh, as was indicated again this morning, driving through the towns that, that had been abandoned. Um, during our visit, we had the opportunity uh, to meet with um, uh, regulatory officials of the new regulator, the JNRA, uh, as well as industry officials, including uh, folks from uh, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, who were actually at the site uh, on the day of the event and the days following. And among the things that made a lasting impression upon me was uh, their moving personal accounts of of what transpired, again, that day and during the, the days following. Um, as we listened to their uh, descriptions of, of what happened, uh, you could hear the anguish in their voices, just that, that personal impact was, was really evident. Even, even through the translators, you could just see and, 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 and feel that. Uh, some of those folks worked uh, for days uh, without knowing uh, whether their families were alive or not or where they were. Uh, and again, it, it was truly uh, moving. Uh, they worked under some very hazardous conditions. Uh, many uh, talked about uh, the fact that they thought they were going to die uh, at any moment. Uh, the radiation levels were, were very, very high. Um, and their professionalism, uh, their dedication, uh, their, their perseverance were, were just very apparent. And it just reminded me, uh, as a regulator, uh, how important it is that we make the right decisions to ensure that U.S. operators are never placed uh, in a similar uh, situation. At this morning's plenary, uh, Mike mentioned the three collective or shared lessons learned, and, and in case you didn't hear them, they were uh, one, to assure that uh, U.S. plants uh, and the NRC are, are prepared for the unexpected. 
secondly, to ensure that uh, the lessons learned um, from Fukushima are implemented, uh, they're maintained, uh, and they're exercised uh, going forward. And, and thirdly, uh, that NRC and the industry uh, appropriately deepen uh, the technical expertise uh, that we need that was so necessary uh, and demonstrated at Fukushima Dainai. And on a personal note, I gained a much deeper appreciation for the stakes involved um, and, and the hazards associated with the industry that NRC regulates uh, and that the industry operates. Uh, and I believe it's very important uh, that we uh, establish and we cultivate uh, a culture, a safety culture, if you would, that recognizes the possibility that an accident can happen and that we put in place uh, measures to, whether it's equipment, uh, processes, procedures, or people, uh, to make sure that we can um, prevent or mitigate any adverse consequences should that, should that occur. And I believe in doing so, uh, the health and safety of the public will be ensured and the environment will be protected. Thanks. Thanks. Um, good afternoon. One of the things that I wanted to reflect on and share with you today is the striking visual images that we saw as we drove up to Fukushima Daiichi. It was, you know, a beautiful day and we should have been expecting to see people out and about. But as we drove through, you notice cars in the driveways, you notice product on the store shelves, but there are no people around. And when you think about it, it was basically a man-made ghost town. These people were no longer there. They had been evacuated. And they were just ordinary people living ordinary lives, never expecting to have to move on. You know, they trusted the operator. They trusted the regulator to keep them safe. And these accidents were just a huge breach of the public trust. They had expected to live there for their lives. Now, granted, uh, the doses were not at the point where there were deaths or significant doses to the population. You could say, you know, evacuation worked. But when these people trusted in the organizations around them, uh, the licensee and the regulator, I'm sure they never expected to have to leave their homes. Three years later, those places are still vacant. Some folks may never return to their homes. And as I thought about if we had a similar situation here, what it must have been like for the officials to have to tell their local populations that they had to move and they may never be back. And as folks like we are that work for the public, I uh, can't quite imagine how difficult that must have been for those in the Japanese um, communities that had to be evacuated. I certainly gained a greater appreciation. I mean, we all exercise these processes. We train on these processes. We know these kind of things can happen. But when you see it firsthand and you see the impact on the people that were there, it was really a very, very sobering experience and one that I truly hope none of us in this room or our colleagues ever have to face. Good afternoon. Um, there were a number of things uh, that resonated with me and uh, left a lasting impression uh, from our trip to both Fukushima Daiichi and uh, Fukushima Daini. Uh, and uh, with, as a result of our discussions with the uh, various operators and site management that were involved in the event response. But one thing I wanted to share with you in particular, uh, and similar to uh, uh, Vic's uh, accounting or discussion of the uh, uh, impact from talking to the various operators and site managers, uh, I had a, a similar reaction when you listened to the first-hand accounts of the individuals that were involved in providing for a response, the extraordinary challenges they faced, the continual uh, setbacks, uh, the tremendous difficulties that they had to overcome. It was compelling in terms of the resiliency and perseverance that was demonstrated by those TEPCO employees. You know, in examples of some of the daunting challenges, uh, you know, three teams that were dispatched in order to uh, be able to uh, operate the air operated valve and motor operated valves in the vicinity of the Taurus uh, in order to establish a containment uh, venting path. And they're dealing with aftershocks and uh, safety relief valve lifting. And uh, the individual, uh, one individual indicated that uh, they thought, uh, or he thought that uh, he uh, was not gonna get back uh, uh, without the loss of his life. 
uh, not knowing uh, whether family members were uh, safe as a result of the earthquake and tsunami, dealing with high dose, uh, high temperatures. Uh, uh, you know, the environment was uh, certainly uh, uh, very, very challenging. Uh, you're in a control room. Uh, with uh, no, you have no power, so you have no lighting, no instrumentation, and the efforts to uh, use car batteries to power instrumentation to obtain indications on uh, reactor pressure vessel level and temperature as well as containment pressure. Those are just some examples of some of the challenges that uh, the TEPCO uh, uh, operators and uh, response managers uh, found themselves having to confront. I would describe those as uh, the use of uh, heroic actions, uh, and I think in understanding what the operators and uh, managers faced. The quote from uh, uh, Ikuo Izawa, who was the shift manager for the Fukushima Daiichi Units 1 and 2 during the event, uh, he said to us uh, when he was giving us a briefing uh, when we were at the TEPCO headquarters in Tokyo, the impact of the tsunami was totally bigger than what we expected, trained, prepared for, or believed was possible. It was unimaginable. We must always be prepared for the possibility that something much bigger can happen. So from my perspective, the significant takeaway was uh, being prepared for potential beyond design basis events means that we ensure that the people, and I say we, both the industry and our role as a regulator, we ensure that the people, processes, and equipment, as well as the infrastructure, are in place such that we don't find ourselves uh, relying on heroic actions to ensure plant safety. I would offer if we find ourselves in that situation, we've failed as a regulator and we've failed as an industry. And so I feel that really underscores the great importance of ensuring that the uh, Fukushima lessons learned and the required actions are fully implemented, uh, maintained, and exercised. Thank you. So between what you heard from uh, Mike and Dennis this morning, if you sat in on their plenary session, and then what you've heard from my fellow regional administrators here in the past few minutes, uh, there's plenty there that have resonated with, with all of us. And, and what they have expressed eloquently describes many of the things that resonated with me. Um, but there's a couple of things that, that I wanted to share with you. And, and one of them is, is uh, somewhat duplicative of what you heard from Commissioner Ostendorf this morning regarding how well this agency and industry have worked to frame what are really the important issues that we should be working on in the aftermath of the uh, Fukushima uh, accident. And I, I truly came away from our visit to Japan with a strong belief that we indeed did do a very good near-term task force in terms of framing the issues for our consideration, the efforts of the uh, Japanese Lessons Learned Directorate and the steering committee in terms of providing the commission their views on, on what ought to be the priorities in the Tier 1 areas and then the Tier 2 and Tier 3, and then the Commission's endorsement of that approach. So I'm fully aligned with what you heard from Commissioner Hassendorf, that we did pick the right things in my visit to Japan, reinforce that in my mind. Uh, the second thing that, that um, I took away that, besides the things that you've heard already from, from my peers up here, is uh, the importance of our incident response program and the training of our licensed operators. Um, the incident response program that exists in this country is, is, is pretty robust. Uh, we frequently exercise biennial exercises involving our state and local officials and, and organizations uh, that work with the licensees and FEMA and NRC's oversight and evaluation of those exercises provide us with a fairly strong uh, framework for assuring public health and safety if indeed those events that we don't believe will occur may occur. And, and so it's important to sustain that robust uh, incident response program. And with respect to our licensed operators, it's very important that we don't overburden our licensed operators, particularly in terms of training and procedures that will distract them from their focus on safe plan operation in the here and now. And so we have to be very careful in terms of, of the balance with which we apply uh, training and procedural requirements on operators for these very, very infrequent and likely never to occur situations so that they can assure that they sustain their focus on what they need to know to operate the plant safely now and particularly the events that would be more predictable to occur so that we can prevent any sort of event that could create core damage from occurring. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, 
I attended a, a trip with the chief nuclear officers um, uh, across the United States back in the September timeframe, both Danny and I did. Um, my reflections uh, of that time really uh, fall into three categories. Um, my deep respect for the response teams uh, at both Daiichi and Daini, the value of training, and the importance for defense in depth and beyond design basis um, scenarios. The respect for the response teams, and it was somewhat stated here, it was amazing to me the number of attempts um, and failures and challenges uh, that they had really at both uh, Daiichi and Daini, um, and the number of creative solutions uh, that, they that they tried um, and attempted, the, the tenacity that they had under such extremely stressful uh, conditions um, was, was really, really noteworthy. Uh, to me, and as uh, we stated, we, we practice our emergency response plans uh, frequently, and I have confidence in them, but it was something else to really be in the midst of it and appreciate uh, that as a leader, you might be sending somebody into harm's way um, in terms of uh, the course of the accident, in, in terms of uh, trying to get things uh, in, a, in a better uh, condition. And, and he shared that honestly with me that says, you know, I, I asked this team to go out, and, and I didn't know if I was ever going to see them again. Uh, and so that really, as a leader, puts, uh, you know, puts things in perspective for you. Uh, the value of training, um, we take training very seriously here, the, the number of hours of training that we have, not only for our operators, but uh, for uh, the, all of our craft and, and engineering talent. Um, it, it really left a deep impression upon me how important it is that we continue uh, with the, the value that we do have of our training programs, especially the hands-on familiarity uh, that we have with our plants uh, and with our systems. And um, in terms of the defense in depth, given that we have all the redundancy that we do have, all the procedures that we do have, uh, the reality is, even with all that, we need to absolutely be able to provide the basics under all conditions, and that's water and power. And with those two ingredients, um, there's no question uh, that we will be able to safely manage our way through and uh, that's why the value of our solution here in the United States with our FLEX program, I have high confidence because I watched them do it on the fly, if you will, at Daini, and how successful that they were, um, and that we need to put our operators in a position where they have those tools, if you will, in the toolkit, um, and they're ready under any conditions. Danny? Okay. Getting to go last, they covered all of my stuff. <laughs> um, I, guys, I'm not going to go back through everything that they talked about. Uh, for, for 25 CNOs to band together and go to Japan to see a first-hand account of what happened there, that was unprecedented. We thought it was important. We thought it was important that we go and get that first-hand account of what happened and why did it happen and gain a, a deeper understanding. We all had read the reports. We've all got all the timelines. We've all went through that stuff but we very much wanted to go see it. So kind of like Cindy said, uh, it was pretty overwhelming uh, when you start getting in close to the plant, not, not to the plant, close to the plant. You start seeing the effects, uh, pr pretty overwhelming stuff there. I I'm not going to go back through it. I thought Cindy did a good job of talking through that. Uh, Vic talked about the moving personal accounts. We heard the same, we heard the same thing. Uh, in fact, that's one thing that I've brought back with me when you look at our uh, emergency response organization, what we tend to do is we go find somebody that's very technically savvy and they can get through these flow charts and, and they're the best technically at getting through these flow charts. But if you go listen to these moving personal accounts about when I sent somebody out there, I wasn't sure if I was sending them to their death or if they were coming back, you realize the amount of leadership that you need to have in that emergency response organization. So I brought that back with me. That's something we're working on. We will need to improve the leadership capability in our emergency response organization. It's not just a uh, technical answer, a technical business. You got to have that leadership piece. And the last thing, uh, with the flex mods that we're all doing, uh, it, it'll work. It'll work. If you look at what happened there and, and why it happened, and you look at what we're all doing at our sites uh, for flex modifications, uh, it, it'll work. So I feel very good about the changes that we're implementing for FLEX and the benefits that's going to bring to us. Thanks, everyone. Let me just ask, pause, seconds, anyone? Actually, I would. 
Okay. <laughs> there was one thing I did want to mention. Um, one of my first impressions really is that it's not over yet. Um, and I don't mean that the cores aren't being safely cooled because they are. Um, but the accident really isn't over yet. If you see the number of tanks that are stored on site with radioactive water inside and um, the challenges that they have even today, many years after, in terms of how to deal with that water. And I would say um, that until we understand and, and they are able to manage that large volume of water that are stored on site in those tanks, and they're building more tanks each and every day to store additional water, um, the accident isn't over and we shouldn't feel that it's over. And we should work as best we can to help them uh, not only process that, but, but safely discharge it. Maria's point resonates with me in conversations that we had yesterday, or I guess two days ago now, with, with the regulator, uh, NRA. Um, we learned, in fact, that as they continue to decontaminate uh, the plant, they, there is a concern, for example, that they might undergo an activity that would result in uh, dust, that dust being carried off site and potentially recontaminating land that has been uh, released. And so they'll face those kinds of issues um, continuing as they move forward. So again, I, great insights from the panelists. Didn't dare uh, start this panel without the opportunity for uh, each of the panelists to share their insights. Thanks, uh, great insights. So let's, uh, let's begin the session. I want to just tell you that the session is intended to be an open uh, discussion of contemporary uh, nuclear power plant regulatory issues. Um, to identify topics of interest, of course, we uh, communicated uh, with the industry uh, chief nuclear officers to pose questions for our panel. We collected uh, as well questions that we uh, thought might be asked. And we've developed four questions that really represent, I think, a compilation of the questions uh, from the list that was provided. And each of the regional administrators will respond to one of those questions and uh, will ask uh, one of the industry reps, Maria or Danny, to respond uh, to those questions. Um, but I just want to remind you that this session really is intended to generate uh, discussion, uh, questions from you. So uh, I would invite you to, as we begin uh, working through the questions, if those questions generate questions in your mind, or if there's some other question that you think we ought to ask, please jot those down on a card uh, that will be supplied to you, and we'll get them uh, brought forward and uh, get those teed up for the panelists. So let's get into it, uh, if you will. The first question deals with uh, safety culture and substantive cross-cutting issues. The question is, what is the NRC's perspective on how the adoption of common nuclear safety culture language will affect the assessment of substantive cross-cutting issues? Include uh, the effectiveness of the SCCI process, or NRC openness to a different approach. And I'd like also for the industry representatives then, uh, what are your perceptions regarding the effectiveness of SCCI? Bill, would you start with the answer, please? Sure. So those of you who know me um, probably are not surprised that I spent a lot of my formative years in front of the television watching cartoons. <laughs> um, and so one of my favorite cartoons was uh, The Adventures of Peabody and Sherman, which is now a full-length movie. Uh, you may want to go out and see it. I haven't seen it yet. Um, but I want to take you into the Wayback Machine for, for a, a couple times as we talk about this. So back in 2008, the commission directed the staff uh, through a staff requirements memorandum to uh, take an evaluation of the agency's uh, safety culture policy and to uh, evaluate it to see whether there was any unique aspects of, of you know, the burgeoning security area in the post-9-11 environment that ought to be incorporated into the safety culture policy, as well as looking at expanding the safety culture policy to incorporate um, a broader set of uh, licensees and certificate holders within the agency. Up to then, it really was sort of focused on nuclear power plant operations, and the sense was we ought to really expand safety culture to the whole uh, suite of, of licensees who uh, we have um, uh, authority over. And so uh, that was done, and, and over about a three, three and a half year period, the staff did what I believe a really phenomenal job in terms of engaging with a wide variety of stakeholders not only industry and MPO, but they talk to fellow regulatory agencies here in the United States, they talk to international counterparts, they engage the public uh, and, and other industries to, to ultimately develop 
uh, a safety uh, culture policy statement that had ascribed to it nine traits. And that was issued in June of 2011. The other thing that that endeavor revealed was there was really a, a challenge in terms of the nomenclature and language that existed within the industry between how the NRC talked about safety culture, how industry or IMPO talked about safety culture, that there was a true need to harmonize that language and be able to uh, come up with, with common language that, whether it was the regulator or the regulated entity, we knew we were all speaking from the same uh, sheet of music. And so uh, that was a very important byproduct of this effort. And in uh, December of 2012, IMPO, uh, put out a, a document, MPO 12-012, Traits of a Healthy Safety Culture, that now I talked about we wanted to harmonize them. They had 10 traits. So our safety culture policy has nine, so we didn't achieve nirvana there. But I will say the one area that was uh, different, the one trait that was different in MPO was one that was, that was a, a fairly um, important one to MPO dealing with decision making. And I'll talk a little bit about aspects of these traits. All the aspects in that decision-making trait have been incorporated into the, um, the NRC's lexicon. So in reality, we've captured that, but we just have nine traits and NPO has 10 in their document. So now let me take you in the way back machine to 1999. The reactor oversight process formation incorporated this concept called cross-cutting areas, CCAs, uh, human performance, problem identification, resolution, safety conscious work environment. And those remain today. We have not changed those since the beginning of the reactor oversight process. But what has changed over the past decade and a half is how do we take uh, those cross-cutting areas and how do we incorporate them into our assessment of plant performance? The intent of these cross-cutting areas and the aspects assigned to each of these cross-cutting areas was to be able to provide some early warning signals, as you will, for licensees that if, if through our inspection process, we determined that uh, a number of our findings uh, had uh, elements of one of these cross-cutting areas. We would provide that information to the licensee so they could look at that and see if there was some trend there that they needed to address. Now, unfortunately, uh, the cross-cutting issue process has been beset with a lot of, of issues. Uh, inconsistency in how they were utilized in the different regions. Uh, a high degree potentially of subjectivity in terms of how you characterize something as a cross-cutting area. Um, really not much regulatory teeth, even if we identified a substantive cross-cutting uh, issue in terms of what we could do with it as a regulator. And so uh, there's been a lot of debate and, and uh, angst over uh, the use of substantive cross-cutting issues over the years. Um, and I think there might be another session on the ROP enhancement. Uh, project, but over the last year or two, there's been actually two independent uh, activities. One directed by the commission, which specifically said, take a relook at substantive cross-cutting issues and see if they make sense. And then also the agency's own independent ROP enhancement project. And so we're in the process of digesting the recommendations from both of those groups. So you may see some more changes in terms of how we uh, uh, utilize cross-cutting areas. And, and I know that we've had meetings recently with industry, and we're very open to other potential alternatives in that regard. But for the here and now, uh, at the end of 2013 was the last year that we had the cross-cutting areas as previously designed. And what we've done is we've done a crosswalk to now leverage the new traits that are identified in the agency safety culture policy uh, into the new uh, approach for how we do assessment of licensees uh, inspection, or licensee findings through our inspection process. And so in the end of cycle letters that just came out very recently, there was a paragraph in there that described this transition. Uh, in terms of what its impact might be, uh, my understanding is from a, a back of the envelope uh, evaluation of uh, doing this crosswalk, there might have been maybe one or two sites across the country that uh, perhaps would have gotten a theme identified in their end of cycle letter under the new uh, criteria that didn't exist under the old criteria. So. I see no real um, impact on how we apply. I think the real benefit is that now we are all speaking from the same sheet of music in terms of what do we mean when we talk about various aspects under safety culture. Thanks, Bill. Danny, um, again, the question is safety culture, 
uh, substantive cross-cutting issues, uh, your perspectives regarding how well it works, um, or any thoughts related to that. Thanks, Michael. Uh, for us to get to, to common language, uh, I mean, to have a common nuclear safety culture language was a positive development for us. I mean, from, from an industry perspective. I mean, we're having to keep two sets of books, right? We got one set of books that we use for the ROP language, and we got another set of books that we use for our NEI, NPO, uh, safety culture monitoring program and commitments that we made there. So we're having to keep two sets of books. So we get on the, we get, we get one set of books now that we can keep track of things. That, so we see that as, as very positive. I see that as positive. Uh, Bill, you talked about a number of issues in implementing um, uh, the uh, substantive cross-cutting issues, and, and I'd agree with that. It's, it's somewhat of a subjective process. Um, it, it's very difficult to see how it's effectively identifying a weakness or a degrading trend. And if you go through and look at uh, how we're using it, and this would be the NRC and industry, I mean, we're spending significant resources trying to decide, do we open up a substantive cross-cutting issue? If we do open it up, uh, how do we address it and, and how do we close it? And it's just a tremendous amount of resources that we apply to that program and it's detracting from resources that could be placed on matters of greater safety significance. Uh, if you look at what we do, I mean, our CAP program has uh, advanced greatly uh, since we implemented substantive cross-cutting uh, issues. And we've also implemented our nuclear safety culture monitoring that we do. So, I mean, I think we can take those two programs uh, and get done what we're doing under the, the uh, uh, SCCI program now. So. So I mean, what I'd recommend is take a hard look at can't we use the CAP program at the sites and our safety culture monitoring program that we do uh, with oversight and, and use those as opposed to the SCCI program. Okay. Um, anyone additional thoughts? Okay. All right. The second question really uh, relates to the government accountability office report that was recently issued that you might have uh, seen. And that accountability report really looked at um, inconsistencies or tried to get into what would be causing inconsistencies um, in implementation of the REACT oversight process across the regions. Uh, and so the specific question is, what processes, measures, or approaches are used to ensure reliable and consistent implementation of the REACT oversight process across the regions? Um, Cindy, would you start with the answer, please? Sure, thanks. Uh, my way back doesn't go quite as far back as Bill's, but I am going to go back in history just a touch. Um, in 2000, as you know, the reactor oversight process was, uh, was created with a significant difference in how we had done assessment prior to that time. Um, but the ROP was developed to be a reliable and efficient way for us to assess licensee performance and for determining appropriate regulatory response. We all use the same procedures, we all use the same guidance documents, and for those things of higher significance, we also include more people. We include the Office of Enforcement or NRR answer as appropriate. So for things of greater significance, our process has increased checks and balances. Now, the ROP was not created to be an assessment tool for regional performance. It was focused on, on licensee performance. But that said, we can use it as an input into looking at how we do our own business, because we are certainly a believer in continuous improvement. Now, the topic of reliable implementation of the ROP, or as some may say, consistent implementation, has come up multiple times, including here in this RIC forum uh, for a number of years, and certainly in the GAO report that Mike mentioned. So it's something that we've been working on for a number of years. Specifically, starting in 2010, the regions in consort with headquarters uh, started what we called the ROB Reliability Initiative where we started taking on various pieces of our program to look for greater reliability in our application of the process. Uh, certain things that we did was, were, for example, increasing our sharing of inspectors across the regions, uh, benchmarking at the staff level. We also had our branch chiefs go to different regions to benchmark and see how they did business. Uh, we also created a forum for discussions of various ROP topics. As an example, 
application of substantive cross-cutting issues and how did each region do that and we made some uh, checks and adjustments. Um, and we also, of course, looked at our documentation, our, our own inspection reports. And then more recently, we did a comprehensive review of the problem identification and resolution inspection and looked at how the regions all did business. Now, since we've received the GAO report, we have also uh, taken some further actions, and those are very actively being worked right now. I do want to note that the focus of this are on the lower risk, less significant. Um, as the GAO pointed to, those seem to be the area where they concluded uh, there was less consistency. And when we acknowledge there is some greater variation on those lower risk, less significant findings. So we wanted to look at how to maximize our um, examination. So we looked at what procedures seem to have the greater differences and we identified the fo following four procedures for intense review. That's the component design basis inspection, operability evaluations, equipment alignment, and maintenance risk assessment. We're currently um, in the process of evaluating some results of some exercises we conducted. The exercises took minor and green findings. Um, we put them in a format where inspectors and branch chiefs could review them and come to their assessments and then those assessments are being uh, compared and we're looking for themes or looking for insights. Uh, we don't have those insights yet, those assessments haven't been finished, but those assessments and those recommendations will also be worked with NRR and NSER, OE in the regions. But some possible outcomes of that could be increased training, maybe on an, the underlying requirement if, if we see some lack of clarity there, um, or on existing guidance. I think it's probably likely we'll see some changes in guidance to try to make it um, more clear and more apparent so we can have greater um, application. But I think we need to keep focused on, we can't expect that there will be a common outcome. We're measuring or trying to do our best to measure licensee performance and licensees aren't all performing in the same way. So we shouldn't have an expectation that we're going to have the same outcome. And that's why we've kind of steered away from the consistency and talk more about reliable application of the ROP. And I too would put a, a plug in for the two ROP sessions that are coming up tomorrow morning, um, session number 35, talking about those enhancement projects. Thanks. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Maria, you may have perspectives regarding uh, differences seen between regions. Um, interested in your thoughts. Yeah, what thanks, Mike. Um, we actually have, as an industry, seen a similar trend as to what was identified in the GAO report uh, in terms of seeing some differences across the region. Uh, some, um, some examples of this are um, you know, some over-reliance on URIs or unresolved um, issues um, uh, in one region, say, relative to another. Uh, we have other examples of uh, 10 CFR 5072 and 5073 reportability um, and seeing some of those differences as it's applied across um, regions. We, we also have seen in some cases um, where we have some newer inspectors that have a lesser understanding of some of the older plant licensing bases. Um, and therefore, they have a tendency to really want to address everything under a more current uh, perspective. So those are some examples where I think we do, as an industry, see this variability um, across the regions. Um, there are a couple of vehicles uh, for us to uh, create that discussion. Uh, there's the um, regulatory uh, users group. Uh, NEI has an ROP uh, task force. And we also just recently formed, again within NEI, a working group, a regulatory issues working group. And these are all forums where we have an opportunity to discuss and create conversation uh, with the NRC about apparent inconsistencies uh, that we're seeing in the application of uh, the ROP as well as the conduct of inspection and enforcement activity. Um, in addition, I guess I would point that uh, the NRC region uh, staff does use technical interface agreements, or TIAs, uh, to ensure that the NRC headquarters is, resolved, uh, is involved in resolving technical differences um, and issues that might otherwise be resolved inconsistently. Um, and I think recently uh, uh, you guys announced uh, that you'll take actions to make the TIA process a little more transparent. Uh, and I think that would, uh, that would be helpful. Thank you very much. Um, anyone want to weigh in? Additional comments? 
Okay. This next question really relates to uh, the use of contractors uh, by licensees and, and uh, oversight of contractors. And so um, the specific question I'll ask uh, Mark to answer, and again, Maria, um, from a regulatory perspective, how well has the industry be doing, been doing uh, with oversight of contractors? And from an industry perspective, what are some of the challenges in determining the proper level of contractor oversight? Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike had asked earlier when we were providing uh, uh, our, uh, I guess, significant takeaways uh, or impressions from uh, our visit to Fukushima Daiichi uh, uh, in uh, Fukushima Daini if we had any seconds. And I wanted to, I had one thought and I, and I would plan to talk about that in the context of this question, but I was particularly, uh, um, um, there was a particular impression I had, and I think uh, Dennis Cole talked about this in the special plenary session, and that was uh, the extensive uh, use of contractors at uh, Fukushima Daiichi in Daini, uh, where when uh, the contractor staff had to evacuate the site, uh, the workforce that remained uh, did not have the skill sets to uh, implement or uh, to uh, conduct a number of work activities, and examples installing and connecting in instrumentation, uh, you know, installing uh, temporary uh, power supplies uh, and terminating cable ends, et cetera. So I thought that was uh, particularly uh, uh, of interest and, you know, I'm sure the industry looks at to what degree does that apply to their sites when you're looking at implementing flex and your on-site staffing analysis, et cetera. But uh, here, regarding uh, uh, regulatory uh, insights uh, with respect to the use of contractors, I particularly appreciate the opportunity to answer this question uh, because we have had uh, some significant events and conditions uh, in Region 4 that have resulted uh, from uh, uh, challenges with uh, inadequate control of contractors. I think everyone uh, recognizes that the licensees remain ultimate or retain ultimate responsibility uh, for activities affecting quality that's prescribed by uh, you know, 10CFR Part 50 Appendix B. Uh, and it, certainly contractors uh, can be effective for highly uh, specialized or infrequently performed evolutions uh, where it may not be practical for a licensee uh, to retain the resources to perform in-house. And then you have the aspect I would call of uh, what I termed a contractor oversight cascading effect. You uh, like to see contracts for specialized work activities and then uh, they end up contracting with a separate uh, engineering organization to provide an independent review uh, because the licensee didn't possess the on-site engineering expertise to perform uh, the uh, uh, oversight function. And I think most uh, significantly is this perception uh, regarding uh, contractors as experts, and, and that, can Im uh, that impression can uh, uh, create some additional challenges in providing contractor oversight. I was talking uh, to uh, site management at one site in Region 4 about control of contractors and uh, a significant event that had occurred at that site. And one of the uh, observations uh, provided by uh, site management was that, uh, you know, what's the expected quality or pedigree of contractor deliverables? Uh, when you contract with an organization and they have extensive experience in that area, um, you know, what is it reasonable uh, to expect in terms of a deliverable and how much oversight do you need to exercise? And it was my understanding from uh, talking uh, to that, that site vice president uh, that there's been some discussion in the context of IMPO in trying to understand what is the right balance and how intrusive does a licensee need to be. I think another challenge that we see uh, with use of contract organizations for licensing and design basis modification activities, uh, it can be problematic in uh, that the in-depth knowledge of design basis documents does not then reside within the licensee staff and that can complicate things like 5059 reviews for plant changes, certainly complicates inspection activities and potentially emergency response. So I, I would offer, uh, we have certainly seen uh, uh, challenges with the uh, control of contractors uh, uh, and, uh, and there are certainly organizations that have done a very good job in that regard, but uh, there are challenges there and uh, certainly an area that I think the industry uh, needs to ensure that uh, they continue to devote an appropriate level of attention. Maria, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, well, just to, to state the obvious, I mean, we absolutely, as the license holder, understand that we own the performance of our contractors, um, and we take that very seriously. And the relationship with the contractor starts well before they're actually on site to perform any work. 
Um, and I think that's very important. If you look at the contrast with our employees who are there with us each and every day, uh, you have an environment where you can impress upon them the right standards for safety and for human performance and the right values. And you don't have that luxury uh, when you're working with a contractor. So you have to take uh, very deliberate steps as you integrate a contractor um, into the broader workforce. And as I stated, that, that starts well before the job at hand. Uh, a couple of things that we do to facilitate that um, is, in fact, meeting with uh, members of the, the management team of the contracting uh, organization. And so an, an example for that is a refueling outage is an area where we bring in several contractors. Um, and for our vendors, we meet with them uh, well in advance of that refueling outage, and we talk about the standards that we have and how are we going to impress those standards, and in some cases use contractual language uh, for incentives or penalties based on human performance and safety performance so that they can take it as seriously, obviously, as we do, um, as they're impressing the same message uh, on the folks that work for them. And then in addition, uh, we have a very rigorous process as we bring folks on site, and especially if they're going to play any sort of supervisory role, uh, where we conduct oral boards, uh, if you will, ask them questions and make sure that they have sufficient rigorous understanding of the standards and our practices before they're even allowed uh, to uh, perform that role um, as a supervisor. And, and as Mark stated, as an industry, we have uh, worked together with INPO um, and have provided uh, or produced some industry guidance relative to uh, contractor um, oversight and ownership. Uh, I would guess just about at any station that you go in the United States, it would be very similar, and that would be any contractor would have an on-site sponsor, um, and that on-site sponsor's role and responsibility is to make sure that they're very familiar uh, with the rules um, and, and the standards of the station. Um, and then, of course, span of control is important, too. So you need to make sure that you have the right level of supervision overseeing uh, the contractors so that you have the right level of span of control. And that's something that we monitor very closely uh, to make sure that we have the right level of engagement and oversight. Uh, but even with all that prescription, it's a challenge for us, obviously, each and every day uh, to ensure that we are, in fact, being rigorous and intrusive after you've paid for this subject matter expert uh, to come in and do some work for you, that you value their subject matter expertise, uh, but you also need to make sure that it's being brought into your organization uh, in a way that's within your uh, guidelines and policies. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Maria. I'm going to, again, offer the second, the opportunity for seconds if anyone feels compelled. Okay. We're trying to show some discipline. Thank you. Thank <laughs> It was like herding cats in Japan. I don't know why we're so, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so the, um, this next topic, 5059, uh, is one that uh, has been, uh, of course, important, that, that regulation is important for us uh, and for licensees. Of course, 5059 uh, reviews and inspections of 5059 um, have gotten visibility, let's just say, in the last year and a half, greater visibility in the last year and a half. And this, this next question really relates to uh, the, the recent results of 10 CFR uh, 5059 inspections. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask, actually, Vic to, uh, to, to, to tee up to answer this question. And Danny, actually, Danny, I'll ask you to start first. The question is, the results of recent 10 CFR 5059 inspections indicate the need for prior NRC approval for replacement parts that have digital components. In some cases, this could delay safety improvement at stations. Are there opportunities that could provide licensees the ability to more rapidly address digital obsolescence issues? So, Danny, um, the subject of 5059 and those inspections. Okay. Yeah, I'll go first. That's fine. We'll give Dick the last word. So, 5059 is real important to us. I mean, that's what authorizes us to go and make changes to our facility without having to get prior approval. It's a big deal for us. Uh, we're, we, our plants are getting older, uh, we're going out and we're replacing components and we're, we're upgrading components and we're, we're making our plants more reliable by replacing these older systems. And what we're finding out is some of these newer systems uh, will have some type of digital logic piece or something on it. Uh, and, and, and Michael mentioned the 5059 inspection that was performed uh, at, a, at another facility, not at one of mine. Uh, but we're getting ready to change uh, some cards uh, at our Farway station. We were going to do that last spring. 
spring of 2013. Um, had to put them on hold because they needed prior NRC approval. That's what the 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 uh, 5059 inspection concluded was their digital devices and they need prior approval before you can go put those in. So you know a year later I still don't have them in and I'd like to get them in this fall but I still don't have a clear path there uh, yet. We're getting closer. We're trying to work through that. But broadly speaking, going forward, we're going to have this in a lot of different areas uh, of our of our stations and and. If we, if we go through and put these types of uh, controls on getting additional reliability in the units, uh, then, then we're really going to be retarding uh, get, getting the units uh, modified, getting them upgraded, and getting them in the shape that we need to have them in. So it's hurting, it's hurting reliability uh, of the units. So we need to take a look at this digital piece. Is this what was intended? Uh, and, and I'm not going to get down into the nuts and bolts because it really doesn't matter. The bottom line is, uh, we'd like to be able to go out and have a program. Don't know what the program looks like, but we'd like to be able to upgrade uh, our stations uh, without having to get some prescribed pre-approvals so that we can get them uh, upgraded and more reliable sooner. I mean, that's where we want to get to. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> and Mike, we are trying to be disciplined because one of the uh, – feedbacks that we've gotten from this session is that we haven't allowed uh, much time for a Q&A from the floor, so we want to do that. You know, I, I recall from the plenary session this morning, one of the last questions with, uh, to the panelists was uh, what are your top few key technical safety issues going forward? I remember Tony mentioned that digital obsolescence was, was one of them. Uh, so it is an important issue. You did advise everyone to- Please uh, silence your phones. Up, right? That's a clear sign. So Danny alluded to the finding last year at one plant. It was a 50-59 uh, mods inspection that did identify that a complex uh, pro programmable logic device, uh, CPLD, a software-based uh, device, had been installed uh, through an inadequate 50-59 um, screening. Uh, it did require uh, a license amendment request um, because of the potential to in introduce adverse consequences. Um, unlike fixed logic devices or circuit cards, which uh, most everyone uses. And, and this isn't a new issue. Uh, the industry recognized it almost, well, more than 10 years ago. In uh, 2002, uh, NEI produced uh, or up, uh, provided guidelines for uh, digital upgrades in NEI 01 and 0101 based on a, uh, every uh, technical report. Uh, and NRC issued a regulatory issue summary 2002 22 um, that uh, in endorsed or at least uh, uh, okay the use of uh, this as an acceptable approach to, uh, to upgrading uh, to digital um, uh, software-based uh, um, devices. It, it did include a, a disclaimer, though. It, it indicated that uh, it cautioned against using uh, this guidance for uh, safety-significant applications, such as a reactor protection system or engineered safeguard uh, uh, SFAS systems. Um, and in this case, it was introduced into a solid state protection system, so there, there was a, a concern, uh, and there was perhaps a misinterpretation, uh, and not just by one, but perhaps several licensees, because uh, the vendor did uh, provide a, a sample screening, a 50-59 screening, uh, and there, again, may have been some misinterpretation of, of the NEI guidance. Since that time, um, we have been engaged with the industry and, and the PWR owners group very closely on this issue. Uh, we have received and are uh, evaluating for acceptance review a topical report uh, in this area. Uh, we're making a lot of good progress on that. Uh, NRR does plan to issue an information notice uh, in this area very soon, uh, accompanied by an, an enforcement guidance memorandum uh, that will address uh, this issue as well, again, to make sure that we, we know uh, exactly what's going on. And there are some provisions of, of that that uh, I know we've uh, talked with NEI about. Um, and we also understand that uh, uh, NEI is uh, planning a revision to NEI 0101 or, or the accompanying 5059 guidance, uh, uh, 9607, uh, that will also help in this regard. Um, in the end, I believe it's up to licensees to do adequate 50-59 screenings. I believe that uh, part of our regulations has been is well understood. I believe it's been used 
uh, well. Uh, we don't typically identify a, a large number of issues in this area. Uh, however, this is, uh, this is an area where we can do better, so uh, we'll continue to work with, you, work with you on that. Okay, very good, thank you. Danny, thanks, Vic. This next question comes from the audience. Um, excited for that, I'll start with that question. Um, the question is, uh, with five plants starting to decommission and five plants being constructed, what extra steps are the regional administrators taking to provide good communication models with the plants? And can or will you apply those models to the rest of the fleet? And so I'll open it up um, for the regional administrators uh, to, to touch on. I think um, Bill, Cindy, uh, Mark, but also Vic. Um, so in any order. Well, let me, let me just start. Um, since we have had recently the opportunity to engage uh, in decommissioning activities associated with, believe it or not, Crystal River, um, which is a region, one, a region 2 site, but it was recently transferred to Region 1 ownership because of a reorganization that we did uh, some years ago where um, basically Region 1 handles all the materials related activities for the entire uh, East Coast, including all the Region 2 uh, states. Um, and so we have uh, applied um, some, some pretty, uh, I think, basic communication tools. Uh, we've had uh, management meetings with uh, the decommissioning management team uh, from Duke. Uh, that occurred uh, not long after we uh, took over responsibility for Crystal River. Uh, there's actually been several public meetings that have been held in the vicinity of Crystal River, and one which I, I really uh, was, was happy to see was conducted by the licensee. I would encourage uh, licensees that are going through the decommissioning process to conduct their own public meetings to talk to the public and explain to them um, you know, what the process is going to be and how you're going to manage uh, activities during decommissioning in a, in a safe uh, manner. Um, and we've also uh, had use of, of webinars as a means to communicate with the public. And I know that uh, Cindy has uh, used webinars quite a bit in Region 3, and so we've stole that uh, tactic uh, and technique from her. So um, I think, obviously, some basic things. Uh, I don't think they're, they're things that are necessarily greatly different than what we do to try and communicate with, with operating plants, but they do carry that different cachet. And of course, those of you familiar with the decommissioning process know that there are actually uh, scheduled or required meetings to, uh, that take place during certain stages of the decommissioning process that are already pretty well dictated. So Maybe I'll just add a little bit. Um, it's really always case by case on developing a communication strategy for a site or for the issues. And so I think we mo try to model what it is we need to communicate based on what our information, uh, excuse me, what our stakeholders are interested in. So uh, we work closely with our public affairs staff, who happen to be right here, uh, to try to discern what level of communication would be most appropriate. So we certainly communicate with the licensee but we also have government-to-government -government meetings if that's appropriate for the, for the topics in the area. Uh, as Bill mentioned, we have used a lot of webinars as a good tool to get out information to our various stakeholders. Public meetings, whether it's a formal meeting or it's an open house because we think people will be more comfortable <laughs> in asking questions and communicating with us. So it, it really is, whether it's an operating reactor, a decommissioning or a materials facility, we try to create a communication strategy that fits um, the topics at hand and the stakeholder interest. Just, uh, just like to offer a perspective uh, uh, in uh, dealing with uh, San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. Uh, I know a number of you in this room uh, can probably appreciate the very uh, interested external stakeholder environment that exists uh, in the state of California. And uh, we have uh, gone to, I would offer, great lengths to ensure that we are uh, uh, communicating with the public such that they have a clear understanding of how we are implementing the uh, decommissioning process. Uh, we did conduct a public meeting, uh, I think it was back in uh, October or November, where we went through the decommissioning process. Uh, we had a senior manager, uh, Larry Camper, that led that discussion. Um, we have also uh, made our inspection reports available to a number of people that requested it. They've been added to the list serve. And, and as Cindy said, I, I agree it's uh, case by case. And we have a you know, specific communication plan. Uh, we are uh, trying to engage uh, the stakeholders to ensure they have a clear understanding. And then 
I think the licensee recognizes the importance of ensuring that they are openly communicating with uh, members of the community. In the case of San Onofre, they've established a community engagement panel and uh, have uh, generated a charter uh, to provide for uh, input from uh, interested uh, stakeholders. I think the degree of uh, public uh, uh, interest uh, dictates how frequently we conduct public meetings and outreach to ensure that we are uh, adequately communicating the information and the results of our inspection activities. And we've had instances where uh, state uh, uh, officials have requested to accompany our inspectors on various uh, inspection activities, and there's a protocol that we go through uh, to provide for that. So. I would just underscore that uh, the approach that we adopt is really a function of uh, the uh, external stakeholder environment and the uh, interest in ensuring that uh, our, our inspection results are transparent and clearly understood. Thanks. So just quickly, Mike, thanks. The question asked for communication models for the five plants being decommissioned and the five plants under construction. So I, I think the communication first starts uh, in internally. We have to have <clears throat> good alignment uh, within NRC, uh, within the region, uh, the headquarters program offices uh, on first how we organize, you know, who has the lead, if you would, um, lead the role in communicating. We have to have frequent interactions uh, to make sure that there's a shared understanding internally on what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. Uh, and the same goes true for uh, our engagement uh, with our respective licensees. Uh, and we've set, we've set up the organization uh, within Region 2 for uh, those plants under construction a good while ago. I see Lauren Plisco back there. He certainly played a key role in getting us organized uh, the right way. Um, we have frequent uh, discussions, uh, frequent public meetings, uh, certainly for Watts Bar. We have the Watts Bar uh, Restart Assessment Group uh, and the, their meetings that are coordinated, um, uh, that are held quarterly. Uh, and their joint meetings between Region 2 and NRR and the licensee, and they're held either uh, near the site or in Atlanta or, or here in headquarters. Um, and similarly, the uh, two AP1000 sites are under the construction reactor oversight process, so we're following that model in terms of the, uh, the public meetings that we have to have for that process as well. Okay, was there anyone else who was going to weigh in on that question? I guess we got it. Okay. All right, this next question I think is uh, maybe intended to be a little bit provocative. I'll ask it. Um, given all of your comments on Fukushima and the importance of issues, uh, those issues um, that we need to work on, why are we allowing inspectors to reopen licensing basis questions that were resolved years ago and have little uh, to no safety significance? It doesn't align with all of you, with what all of you spoke about, um, nor what the commissioner stated in their comments about aggregate uh, regulatory impact. Um, so I'm going to ask Mark uh, if you'd start with that, and then we'll see if others want to weigh in. I uh, asked for the opportunity to respond to this question because uh, I do have some sites in Region 4 where uh, site management has communicated this very uh, point to me uh, during my uh, visits. Uh, to the sites here as I was uh, transitioning to uh, my responsibilities here in Region 4. Uh, and there are a number of factors that come into play here. Um, I think uh, it is very important that uh, we have a shared understanding regarding what is the potential safety significance uh, of an issue. You know, you're, sometimes you're dealing with uh, pre-GDC plants, uh, sometimes in the licensing documentation uh, there may have been a meeting between the licensee and the NRC, and there's not a lot of specificity regarding the discussions and the conclusions. Um, um, and, and other uh, issues that we've dealt with is retrievability of the licensing documentation. Uh, an inspector brought an issue forward with one licensee regarding tornado missile protection, and the licensee's response was, uh, well, that's not in our licensing basis, and the context here was either horizontal or vertical uh, uh, protection. Uh, and uh, the uh, senior resident uh, without a lot of effort, uh, uh, conducted some research, and sure enough, uh, in the uh, licensing basis documentation was reference to the uh, facility needing to be protected against a vertical tornado missile hazard. So um, I think there's a, a, a couple of factors that come into play. One, it is important 
that the inspectors are not uh, dedicating time and effort to issues that have relatively uh, limited safety significance. And I see the importance of the branch chief exercising appropriate oversight and understanding the issues that the inspectors are identifying and ensuring there is an uh, agreement that that issue is of uh, potential significance such that it warrants some additional follow-up. But I also think licensees have a responsibility to uh, 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 be able to retrieve the uh, licensing basis documentation that does disposition the issues. Um, um, and, and I have uh, examples there uh, where um, um, we had inspectors who were bringing some issues uh, forward and, and the licensee's response was, uh, well, we already know we have challenges in that area. Uh, but if the inspectors have a question regarding operability or the adequacy of a 50-59, you know, they can't just say, okay, the licensee is aware of their challenges in that area and not address that. So uh, uh, I guess in summary what I would say is uh, it does take uh, uh, an effort by both the licensee and the NRC to ensure that, that we understand whether there is an issue of, of particular safety significance and whether we're dedicating the uh, appropriate level of resources uh, to evaluate that. But, but for me, it is an issue that's on my radar screen and I know that there are some challenges in that area that we uh, need to make sure we get our arms around. Danny, I'll start with you and then also Maria ask, uh, given Danny, your role uh, with respect to cumulative effects of regulation and, and uh, in the context of Fukushima as the question was posed, what, do you have a perspective you want to share regarding uh, issues being dealt with uh, in the mind of the person asking the question at a low level given, uh, given the issues that we're dealing with with, with respect to Fukushima and other neighboring yeah, issues? I, yeah, Michael, I do have a couple of thoughts and then I'll let Maria um, add on. Uh, you know, once a compliance issue is out there on the table, to me that's one thing, uh, but, 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 uh, we seem to be applying a lot of resources and inspection hours and a lot of work, to me, in the areas that are not as safety significant, and that's the ones where we probably ought to have them directed on the items that are safety significant. Uh, I mean, one, once, once you got a compliance issue identified, I mean, we as licensees are, I mean, we got to go fix that, we got to go make that right, that's, that, and that's our, that's ours to go do. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're not distracted from what our focus should be every day. I mean, safe and effective operation of the units, that's where we want to be. And we don't, we don't need to have our operators distracted. There's only a certain number of management attention units that we have at the sites as well. So we're very, uh, we're protective right now over what are we going to add, what are we going to do different, what are we going to start doing from this day forward. We're, we're still having additional programs that come out uh, over the last uh, decade, we've had uh, additional rules that have been passed. So we've got additional inspections, we've got additional scope to worry about. So, so I do understand the question. I know why they asked the question. Um, we just need to make sure we got our resources focused on what's important and what's going to bring the best uh, uh, safety and the best um, uh, value to the, both the regulator as well as the stations. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Well, we talked about five plants being decommissioned and, and five starting up, and we also talked about Fukushima. And I would just paint in that picture um, the real onus is on both of us to be effective and efficient um, and to ensure that we're spending our time wisely. And um, I, I think there are cases where um, things get kicked up um, and, and we spend time, energy, and effort on those. When, when you have this volume of things that you're dealing with, it's very easy to get task-focused and then just keep running down the path and you sort of lose sight of what's the most important thing. And, and I think the challenge in this case really is on both sides. It's on the industry side as well as it's on the regulatory side uh, to make sure that we are focused on the most important stuff, we're being as effective as and efficient as we can and create dialogue. Um, you know, when we find, in fact, these examples, if we think that we're, you know, sort of chasing after something that's not really value add, uh, I think the real onus is on us to create the right conversation uh, to say, you know, I'm looking at it differently. Glad to fix it if it's something that needs to be fixed, uh, but really let's not, let's not spend undue time if it's not value add. Right. If I could just add one real quick point to that. Uh, what uh, Maria said really resonated with me in that uh, I do know some examples where when I was at the site and I asked the licensee, well, have you elevated this concern? And the answer is no. And I would offer, the, you know, what Maria said underscores the importance of ensuring if you, you feel that the inspectors are engaging in an area that, as you described, is not value added and would result in an unnecessary expenditure of resources to resolve. That needs to be elevated uh, such that we can step back, look at that, and reaffirm either it is something that we need to pursue or 
uh, if necessary, quite frankly, to uh, pr uh, opportunity for some coaching and uh, calibration. Okay, this next question actually stays with uh, a, a little bit the theme regarding inspections and, and issues, significance of those issues. And we haven't said, we haven't said significance determination process yet, I think, in this discussion. Um, the question is, uh, what insights can you provide on experience with the application of the SDP when evaluating events involving operator actions? And uh, I'm going to ask, I think, Cindy, if you'd start with that. Yes, thanks. This was one that uh, we thought might come up, so uh, we did some uh, polling with our SRAs as well as people that have been dealing with the SDP process. Um, and it, it's not an easy area when we're talking about human reliability. And it is an area when we do have um, regulatory conferences that we have a lot of discussion about what appropriate credit is. And so, you know, when we look back at our uh, risk analysts, we have a certain set of tools that we use. It's our SPAR-H model. Uh, our folks have training in that, and they are the ones that exercise that uh, program, as well as peer reviews. Our, our SRAs don't work in isolation, so uh, we're getting multiple risk analysts that put their heads together because it isn't a cookie-cutter approach. Um, there are judgments involved. And I think what we tend to find is what the more difficult areas is uh, operators recovering unknown situations, things that they don't have procedures for, things they didn't necessarily have training for, where they would have to do more diagnosis, figure out what to do, how to approach it, and so forth. And so um, our assessment of that hasn't always aligned with uh, industry's assessment of that, where industry tends to give a little bit more credit for that, and we probably are a bit more conservative on it. But it's an area where we don't have a lot of hard and fast, easy to point to um, data. And so there is some judgment involved, and it is an area where we do um, our best set of assumptions and our best set of um, reviews. The point I guess I would offer to you is, the earlier you have insights provide them and have our risk analysts talk with your risk analysts, because often we can come to some common understanding. Uh, but there will be times when we agree to disagree. But the earlier we can have those interactions, the better. Unfortunately, sometimes these interactions happen very late in the process, and it makes it more difficult for all of us. Anything to add? Yeah, I guess I'll reflect on that. I, I had some personal experience with that um, in, in 2013. Um, so I'll reflect on it in a couple ways. Um, appreciate the, uh, the rigor of the model that, that the NRC um, uses. I, I do think that there are um, valid justification uh, to adjust uh, the numbers used when you're talking about procedures and training, um, ample crew staffing, um, uh, this kind of thing. And so I, I think we do need to create some openness uh, relative to, um, you know, sort of all of the, the processes that, that we do utilize and in, in uh, some cases I think play a significant role. My, my personal experience through this one, uh, I guess I would uh, also offer, it, it appears to me that we create an undue weight for automatic actuation of systems. And uh, I guess I would, I would ask for um, that to be uh, really looked at. And in, in the case that we found ourselves in, um, you know, you could have put a system in automatic, which quite frankly, um, if it had automatically actuated, could have actually created a much more challenging situation to deal with. And so in this case, you in some cases purposely don't want to have something in automatic because you want thoughtful operator action uh, to evaluate the situation and make sure that you want something or you don't want something. And, and by doing that and crediting that thoughtful operator action, it actually worked against, uh, uh, if you will, the formula, let me just say, that you get sort of more credit with, with the automatic operation. So I think this very much is a case where there's never going to be one formula that's going to work when we talk about uh, the human reliability analysis, uh, but I think there does need to be more openness uh, relative to some of the, uh, uh, the credits that can be applied and not just a floor or a ceiling, if you will, um, for, uh, for the number. Okay, we've got a couple of questions that relate to uh, Fukushima, uh, either 
the near-term task force uh, recommendation, uh, in this case, the recommendation for the seismic uh, reevaluation. I'll give you that question in a second. Also, a question that relates to uh, what we were able to see in Japan regarding uh, the, the, the use of or the installation of filtered uh, uh, severe accident capable vents, um, filters uh, on those vents uh, for BWRs. Um, and, and so let me actually start with that. The question is, during the visit to Japan, did NRA talk about its mandate to require filtered severe accident capable vents on BWRs? Given the Commissioner's decision not to support the NRC staff recommendation for identical safety countermeasures for U.S. BWRs, please comment on your comfort level with it. Uh, with it can't happen here. Um, uh, I think I recognize his handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the answer to the, to, the, uh, to the instant question is no, uh, we didn't actually probe with the Japanese regulator uh, in any depth uh, their regulatory requirements. I think the, the commenter earlier <coughs> this morning or one of the speakers earlier this morning sort of drew, uh, drew the parallel to uh, the response that the agency took or the, in, the country took actually following 9-11 and how serious it was for us because it happened here. And, and what we recognize as uh, really the role or the, the posture that the regulator in Japan has taken with respect to its uh, seriousness given what they faced. Um, we did see at, uh, at uh, Kashiwazaki, Kaiwa, uh, for example, that they are installing, uh, they are installing filters. Uh, the, in fact, they're installing two filters, uh, uh, a filter that is uh, below grade actually um, because the local uh, prefecture uh, um, wanted it, it uh, was concerned about um, that. Um, and so we do know, uh, at least uh, based on what we were able to see there, that there is, uh, there are um, filters being uh, added. Uh, we were surprised, or I guess uh, one uh, impression that I had was how small that footprint was. Um, we, uh, and I hadn't actually appreciated uh, the size of the footprint. Um, and so we, I think we were, as, as a group, uh, sort of impressed by that. Um, we, you know, I don't, I, I do want to recognize that the Commission does have the issue, did uh, decide on the issue. Um, ultimately, the Commission will have to decide on uh, where we end up with respect to the recommendation. Um, and, and it could look like, actually, um, filters, or it could look like uh, the use of filtering strategies or a combination of the, the two of those. So. That's how I would leave uh, the answer to that question. I do want to pause and see if anyone would add anything. Uh, Maria, you've had uh, uh, really close involvement on this, so what would be your perspective? Yeah, thanks. I told Danny it was his to answer. Um, <laughs> no, so, uh, yeah, I, I've been very engaged with this, uh, uh, as, you, as you know, uh, across the industry. And I, I guess I just wanted to be very clear. Um, it has always been um, our perspective that we very strongly support filtering. There's no question uh, on the need for filtering, and we're very passionate about it. Um, our, our challenge is that there's more ways to accomplish that than simply an external filter. And our passion has really been to make sure that that filtering works. And by putting the right tools in the hands of our operators, we are ensuring absolutely that we are maintaining containment. And if we're maintaining containment, then it can be used as a reservoir, if you will, um, for filtering. And so we're very passionate about the fact that, um, that it needs to be filtered. Uh, our, our challenge is, again, not to be locked in. There's only one way to do it. Um, and uh, we feel very strongly that there are um, other ways to accomplish it, and in fact, other ways that put the operators in a position where they absolutely know they need to add water and keep that core cool, uh, because ultimately that's the solution set that maintains containment, and that is the focus. Thanks, Maria. This, uh, this other question related to Fukushima and uh, near-term task force recommendation 2.1, the seismic uh, hazard reevaluation, is that licensees, uh, seismic hazard submittals are due March 31st, 2014, and NRC prioritization is due April 30th, 2014, only 30 days. How will the NRC work with uh, the 2.1 seismic industry task force to assign group one, group two, group three priority plants? 
And will consideration be made to keep the industry seismic resources um, on uh, existing seismic PRA projects already underway pre near term task force uh, recommendation 2.1? Um, so, again, uh, a very good question uh, related to uh, how we're moving forward. Um, and the, the person that raising the question has, uh, has the dates just right. Um, we've worked uh, considerably uh, with respect to uh, making sure that. Uh, we're clear from uh, on the part of the NRC, um, but also uh, in terms of working with uh, the seismic uh, industry seismic task force uh, that we're clear about what uh, we need to see in terms of that submittal uh, on the 31st of March um, and uh, how we expect that submittal to be factored in or considered by the NRC in terms of us uh, making uh, a near-term decision with respect to prioritization and a near-term decision with respect to um, uh, what, uh, if any, interim actions are needed for those plants that are where they are necessary. I think rather than try to answer the details of the question, I won't do it justice. Um, I will say that we've had considerable interaction. We issued a letter, NRR issued a letter actually um, that uh, to the industry that talks about our expectations with respect to, for example, uh, operability and reportability. That, uh, that letter is certainly uh, uh, publicly available. We call it the leads letter, but I'm told that Jennifer <laughs> signed out the last one, I know. Uh, um, but it's still called to, we still refer to it as the, the, the leads letter. <laughs> um, but, but I think that provides clarity with respect to uh, sort of the immediate decisions that licensees have to make. There is uh, a, a more detailed uh, approach that we'll use in terms of stepping through the decisions that we have to make. Uh, we've begun sharing that. We'll share that broadly. Uh, we're sharing it internally. We'll certainly share that. We talked, in fact, uh, had an interaction in the last couple of days about how we roll that out from a communications perspective. We do want uh, there to be clarity uh, with respect to how uh, licensees uh, would respond. Um, and we are, in terms of uh, looking at, there'll be a product from the NRC that, that provides that binning, if you will, that was very similar to the letter that provided um, binning uh, in the, for the case uh, of, the, of the initial um, work that we did on flooding, uh, re the flooding reevaluation. There'll be a very similar letter, and we'll interact uh, with the working group in terms of how we set those bins up, being mindful of the fact that we do really want to make sure that we uh, get after, uh, if you will, the plants. Um, uh, we consider where plants fall out in that bin based on the priority um, that we see uh, arrive at based on what's provided in the reanalysis. So I, I'll just try to leave it there, and if uh, I will, I will uh, indicate that there are folks in the room uh, who can provide additional answers, and there'll be more information coming with respect to that. I want to switch gears and talk about Part 37. Hey, Michael, can I add one oh, thing to, yes, to, to that discussion yep. you just had? Uh, it's really from, from the point of prioritization. I mean, if I look at, if I look at where I think our units are going to line up, I've got a pretty good feel for what, what priority they're going to fall in and where they're going to be and what we're going to do. But uh, if you look at, uh, across, across the nuclear fleet, uh, I mean, we need some help with prioritization. You know that. We, we, we've been talking about having to go do these SPRAs. So we're going to go do seismic PRAs. We know that's where we want to go, and we know there's a limited resource in providing those. So we, we're just asking that, that we take a look at how many of these are going to be required, who needs to do them, and when they need to have them done, and lay out that prioritization effectively. Uh, I, mean, I, I think that's something that would, that, would, that would help the industry out a lot in getting these things done in the right order, in the right order. Yeah, absolutely, Danny. In fact, we've, the, the way in which we approach, the, uh, we've sort of been alluding to the follow-on steps and, and, for example, the, the use of the expedited approach, um, for example, the way in which we've structured all of that is to recognize that there are some things that can be done nearer term. We want to screen out and then screen down. Uh, and have actions in place uh, to buy the time that we need for plants to do a seismic PRA for that small subset, hopefully smaller subset of plants that have to do a seismic PRA. So we've, we've built that approach in mind, again, with actions to take interim actions and uh, actions through the expedited approach for plants that need to do that to buy that time. Okay. You know, we've been working together, as you know, Michael, uh, very hard on this. 
I'm hoping to say that we can reflect back on this one and it will be a success story uh, of both the industry um, and the regulator uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that we are using effectively our resources and we're spending those on the ones that need it um, and at the same token, given credit for previous analyses like IPEEE's, um, to use the results of that to say, based on that, I don't need to spend, you know, resources um, on this one over here. So uh, a lot of hard work has gone into this prioritization and the screening process, and, um, and I, I think a uh, job well done on, on both the regulator and, and the industry's part. Okay, so we have uh, five minutes. I think that's time maybe for one more question. It'll be uh, part 37. Uh, and the question is, what impacts are you seeing as a result of preparations for the new part 37 rule uh, at operating reactors? Um, Bill, do you want to yeah. start? So let's go back on the Wayback Machine one more time. Uh, so uh, the events of 9-11 led to a flurry of, of activity by the agency in terms of uh, putting out a number of orders uh, to a variety of, of licensees, both reactor and materials licensees, in terms of uh, enhanced security measures that we expected them to take. Uh, so some years ago, uh, we issued uh, Part 73, the revised uh, security, power reactor security rulemaking. And when we issued that, we had um, a bit of a, a, a late in the game realization that, oh, by the way, uh, this rule applies to Part 50 licensees, and there's a number of, of uh, decommission sites that are basically ISFACs, independent spent fuel storage installations, that fall under Part 50, and the rule applies to them as well. Uh, and that led to a flurry of activity and, and probably uh, some unnecessarily regulatory burden on, on some of those licensees in order to, to try and, and resolve that issue uh, through the uh, appropriate uh, regulatory processes. So part 37 is basically the codification of the increased controls orders that were issued uh, for materials licensees. Uh, and so it's being called the materials security rulemaking. Well, lo and behold, again, sort of late in the game, so this demonstrates that even though we talk about being a learning organization, maybe we're not as good as we can be sometimes, um, that power reactor licensees also had a piece of the pie. Now that doesn't mean that our Part 37 rule specifically addresses uh, Part 73 and basically exempts licensees from having to apply Part 37 uh, requirements, uh, but basically within the protected area and taking credit for the uh, licensee security plan. Um, but what we didn't think about was that there are outside of uh, the protected area at nuclear power plants um, certain large components, uh, many of them stored in robust, robust structures, things like steam generators that were removed from the plant or reactor vessel heads and so on. So these huge monstrous components, but they meet the requirements of Part 37 because they contain um, quantity, uh, category one or two uh, quantities of material. And so here we are with the rule coming into implementation on March 19th. Uh, working to get out a enforcement guidance memorandum that will provide uh, some relief uh, to uh, the nuclear power plant um, uh, industry relative to these large components so that um, we can appropriately not uh, um, cause them to be in violation of Part 37 because of uh, sort of the late thought that those needed to have the same sort of controls as uh, materials licensees. So, so that EGM, uh, I think, is going to be out. If it's not out already, it should be out fairly soon. We, we concurred in it this yeah. past week. Yeah, it's been concurred in, but I'm not sure if it's been publicly released yet. So, so we're working with industry. I think there's been a couple of meetings uh, in the very recent past to talk about this. I guess I'd be interested in, in Danny or Maria's views in terms of how they feel that dialogue's going. I got one thought, and Maria, I'll let you have it. I mean, the, the biggest thing to me is that if we got a Part 73 rigorous security program at the plant, then we shouldn't be applying Part 37 on top of Part 73. To me, that's that's the biggest thing. We've got overlapping programs. Part 73 is robust. We know it's good, so we got it inside the fence. Uh, so, so I think we should support a change that says, hey, if you got Part 73, then Part 37 does not apply. 
Yeah, I, I agree with Danny's request. I, I do think ultimately we need to, to look at that, and the industry would support a change to Part 37 uh, that would exempt, um, based on our already robust physical security measures that we have in place. Um, you did mention the large components like old steam generators and reactor vessel heads. There are in some cases some sites that also have um, some Category 1 and 2 uh, material like uh, resins and, and those kinds of things that are uh, located um, in the owner-controlled area. And, and so those are things yet that we need to uh, ensure um, are covered under this Part 37. But I do believe NEI has taken the appropriate action and they have an industry template um, for these plans to be completed. Um, and it is expected that all of the sites uh, will in fact have a Part 37 security plan in place by March 19th. So I think the immediate um, uh, items will be in place. But I, I do think as, a, as, a, um, as an opportunity for us to step back, again, going back to are we focused on the most important stuff and make sure that there was a need for Part 37 to be applied uh, as opposed to just taking credit for our already robust uh, security plan. Okay, we're out of time. I have uh, one more question that I held for the end, hoping we would be out of time so we wouldn't have to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to say we didn't answer. We didn't ask it, and we won't answer. We we won't answer it. But uh, didn't ask it, we won't answer it. But the the question is, uh, if a situation like Fukushima occurred in the U.S., how would how would uh, the regulator and and I would extend that to how would the industry deal with the buildup of large quantities of contaminated water? And I, again, we'll, we'll answer that question uh, as we answer questions that don't get asked in session. Um, but that question, I think, points to the fact that uh, with respect to Fukushima, we will continue to learn lessons. I think, I think it was an eye-opener, as, uh, as I think Tony uh, mentioned uh, in the earlier session, uh, just the quantities of wastewater and how, you, how do you deal with that, um, the decisions that uh, the Japan is making with respect to allowing people back in. Um, all of those things that they'll have to work through will be opportunities for us to learn uh, and uh, to look and to see whether the things that we need to do with respect to uh, either our posture as a regulator or things that industry would need to do. So um, it's a good question. We'll, we'll answer it. I, I want to just pause and uh, say thanks to the panelists. Um, I think you all did a wonderful job. You're welcome. Um, so, thank you. Thank you for your attendance.